the private markets, if you could accurately graph this or measure it, or specific, you can't accurately, it's hard to be specific, dwarf the public market. So let's just think about the United States. Just companies of 100 million of revenue or more, so not sole proprietorships, but like real companies, there's seven times more private companies in the U.S. than public companies of that scale and size. Your opportunity set as a private market or a public market investor today are more limited. While Meanwhile, more and more of the opportunity set, particularly in growth, exists in the private markets. And if you're not accessing the private markets, I would argue strongly you're really missing out. You're limiting yourself to a modest subset of the opportunities available. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. If you're watching this video, you're probably familiar with what stocks are, either through hearing about them on the TV business news shows or investing in them through your retirement and brokerage accounts. For the most part, these are shares in companies that are publicly traded. But there's a whole other world of companies out there that are privately owned and don't trade on the financial exchanges. This is the world of private equity, where the more deep-pocketed and professional investors operate, often gaining access to value that the smaller retail investor never gets a shot at. Well, that may be changing. New regulatory flexibility and new business models are now promising to help more individual investors tap into private equity when appropriate. So what exactly is private equity? What are its advantages and its risks? To demystify this asset class for us and help us understand its opportunities, we're fortunate to have Bob Long, CEO of Stepstone Private Wealth, here on the program today. Bob, I've been looking forward to this discussion for a long while. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to it also. All right, good. Well, look, a lot of folks watching here have heard about private equity. I don't think most people really feel like they understand well what it is. Yeah. So we're going to really explain that for folks today. Really quickly, um, just to sort of set you up here as to how and why you're a private equity expert, can you just give us just, just a quick background uh, to your career and, and to what StepZone does? Sure. Uh, I've been in the private markets for about 30 of my 40-year business career. It's been primarily focused over those last 20 years on expanding access to the private markets for individual investors. And the challenges that have prohibited individual investors from accessing institutional caliber private markets have been around liquidity, opacity, and some of the other topics that we're gonna to cover today. At Stepstone, we're expanding access to the private markets through a series of evergreen funds that we'll talk about later. Give me, a, I'll let you give you a little bit of background on Stepstone. So Stepstone is probably one of the largest firms, even a sophisticated audience like the wealthy on audience is not familiar with. We're one of the largest allocators to the private markets globally. We manage or advise on over $600 billion of assets. We commit over $80 billion a year in 550 separate transactions. We do that in all the major private market asset classes, private equity, credit, real estate, and infrastructure. You'll notice that we talk about private markets, not alternatives. We're not in the hedge fund business or the commodity business. We're in the private market business. We operate our business from 15 countries and 25 offices, and we're truly a global firm, a thousand of us focused on making the best possible private market investments. Okay. So in this kind of you know hidden world that I mentioned that the average investor doesn't get to see, uh, Stepstone plays a pretty big role. Um, and obviously you've been, you know, in the private markets for a good chunk of your career. So let's actually define this term. W when we talk about private equity, what exactly are we talking about? Well, you know, it's interesting. So most people are more familiar with the public markets, even though the private markets substantially predate the public markets. You know, private investing goes back to the foundations of capitalism. On a more recent basis, you might think about the Rockefellers investing with the Carnegies and building businesses. That was private equity in a sense. When my, my uncle Terry helped my uncle Sneak by the local car dealership, his name was Sneak. <laughs> All goes together. What a great name it, for a car dealer. <laughs> perfect. In 1965, that was a private market investment. But what we think of today as the institutional private markets are, are somewhat different. So this is an industry, call it, 50 years young, 
What we have today is organized pools of institutional investor capital that is allocated to a general partner or investment manager on a discretionary basis. Those pools of capital are typically organized as a limited partnership with a general partner, that manager I mentioned earlier, limited partners, passive investors, these large sophisticated institutions. Those funds are organized with a limited life. That is, they go buy a company and they sell a company and then the manager and the investors split the profits. They're generally organized around a 10 to 15 year life and they involve making a commitment to a fund where you're committed and your capital is drawn over time and returned to you over time. So very different than the typical public market investment where you make an investment in a stock, a bond, or a mutual fund. You invest all of it, and then you sell a piece or part over time. So these are complex structures that are organized really for the needs of large institutional investors. And that's that's a sense of what the, the uh, institutional private equity market is today. Analogous markets exist in private real estate credit and infrastructure. I think we'll we'll try to, for given our time today, we'll focus on private equity principally. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess first thing to note is, um, you know, obviously these are these are private companies. You're really investing them in them through the structure that's really a fund, uh, and you are you're tying your money up for a certain period of time, right? It's not it's not so much yes. like a like a the fund that you buy in the public markets where you can buy today and sell tomorrow type of deal. Um, so uh, there's a I know there's a lot we're going to get into here, but I, I know that there are sort of uh, three subcategories of private yeah. equity. Do you want to define what those are? Sure. So at a high level, think of the private equity market as three segments. So venture capital, the most innovative, highest risk, also highest return opportunity companies, generally pre-profitability. So that's venture capital. And you can have early stage within that later stage, but think of venture capital as very high growth, generally pre-profit. Then you've got growth stage, which are companies that are profitable, generally not mature enough and established enough to take on meaningful leverage. The private equity investment into a growth company or growth equity investment is typically the first institutional capital. And as the name suggests, those companies are on a high growth trajectory. The final category, the most mature, is what's typically known as the leveraged buyout market. So that is acquiring companies that are either private or even public and taking them private, typically through the use of leverage with the idea you can improve those companies and sell them. Those are the three segments, venture growth, LBO. Okay, um, very useful. Again, we're gonna get more into the details here. It, it sounds like with private equity, you're, um, it, it, I guess it's different in, in every one of those three segments, but a big part of the return is the expectation that at, at sort of the, the end of the fund's life, you're, you're gonna sell to somebody who's gonna pay you a lot more money than, than you initially put in, correct? Yeah, that's right. So in a private equity fund, you may have some assets that organically yield and, and perhaps pay a dividend, or you might own a preferred security that uh, the fund might own, and you know, you're an investor in the fund, therefore you participate. You might own a preferred security that pays out some dividends, but generally these are investments that involve buying a company, improving its market value, and then selling it over time. The typical life would be, most deals are underwritten at a five-year life, you know, some are shorter, some are longer. And then of course the fund, and this is what's complex about it, a fund is making 12 to maybe 25 or even more if it's a venture fund, a series of investments in individual companies. And as the limited partner in the fund, you're participating in all of that. By the way, that creates a lot of cash flows back and forth, which can be very efficient from an internal rate of return perspective and ideal for a large sophisticated investor who can immediately reinvest that capital in an efficient way really complex for individual investors, which is something we'll talk about more. Okay. And, uh, and the benefit of these funds is they're being run by a general partner or whatnot that, yes. that has a lot of expertise doing this. So, so part of the benefit of this is one is an, is an investor. Um, I can own a piece of this company. I don't have to go out and buy the, the whole company myself to, to own a bit of a private business. 
uh, but but more importantly, I'm leveraging the expertise, the experience, the skills of, of somebody who does this a lot, and they're in many cases deploying the capital and the fund across a basket of opportunities. Right. That's correct. So the diversification point within a fund is critical, and you made that point. In addition to that, the sophisticated investors will diversify their private market investments. So if you think about a university endowment or a sophisticated foundation, they're going to have 20 to 30 percent, maybe more of their overall pool of assets within private equity. And then within that, they're going to be diversified across venture growth and LBO. And then within that, they're going to allocate to a number of managers who have different expertise that might be size of company, that might be industry, that might be geography. So really what you're talking, well, think about your public markets portfolio, right? You don't own one healthcare stock or even three small cap stocks. You generally own a series of those to achieve the benefits of diversification that occurs in the private markets. It's just a little harder to get there with this fund structure. Got it. All right. Well, look, I, I want to I want to now get into like, OK, so kind of understand what it is. What's important about it? Like, why, why should I yeah. care as an investor? Why should I why should I want to participate in that? Um, let's get to that question. But just really quickly to help folks kind of contextualize this. Um, how, how big is the private equity market? Gosh, you know, trillions of dollars. I mean, it okay, is a so massive market. I, I don't think I can quote you a recent figure, but think about it. Stepstone, we are 600 billion in the private markets. Or maybe you think about it differently. The private markets, if you could accurately graph this or measure it, or specific, you can't accurately, it's hard to be specific, dwarf the public market. So let's just think about the United States. Just companies of 100 million of revenue or more, so not sole proprietorships, but like real companies, there's seven times more private companies in the US than public companies of that scale and size. If you went down, you know, if you looked at even smaller companies, that ratio would increase. So, and perhaps I'll, I'll get into there. Over my working career, the public markets have stayed flat or even shrunk in the number of companies. Meanwhile, the private markets have dramatically expanded. And so your opportunity set as a private market or a public market investor today are more limited. While Meanwhile, more and more of the opportunity set, particularly in growth, exists in the private markets. And if you're not accessing the private markets, I would argue strongly, you're really missing out. You're limiting yourself to a modest subset of the opportunities available. Okay, great. Yeah, I wish I had thought to answer that, ask that question a few minutes ago, because I would have definitely mentioned it in my intro which is basically, you know, if you are just investing in the public markets, you're investing in a relatively small fraction of the opportunity set out there. And as you said, the majority of the growth tends to be in these private companies as well. And you're, you're, you're just not getting a chance to play in that as a, as a regular real retail investor, or at least you, you haven't yet. And then we'll, yeah. we'll talk about some of the changes that are coming along here. But OK, so uh, that's super interesting. OK, so then why care? Like, wh why why yeah. should somebody who is, you know, happily trading stocks and bonds on the public markets and their retirement accounts or their brokerage accounts, yeah. why should they care about getting exposure to this sector? Well, uh, past is not always prologue and prior results are not always an indication of future results. But historically, the institutional caliber private markets, particularly the private equity market, have outperformed the public markets by four or 500 basis points per year, four or 5% or more. Moreover, an investor who participates in private equity gets diversification benefits. So when your public market zigs, your private market zags. You benefit from that diversification and lack of complete correlation in the private markets. The private equity is probably correlated 60 or 70% with the public markets. And importantly in that regard, let's think about periods, let's think about tough periods, let's think about drawdown periods, periods of uh, tough performance or weak performance in the public markets. Historically, the public markets, the private markets have only participated in or captured, to use the investor term, captured 40 to 60% of the downdraft in major financial downturns like COVID, like the global financial crisis, like the tech bubble. 
40 to 60 percent of the downside. Meanwhile, institutional private equity has captured 110 to 120 percent of the upside. So this is what investors look for, right? It's asymmetric risk reward and high quality private equity has demonstrated that over billions and billions of dollars of investments over now 20 plus years. So we feel as an industry that that phenomenon is well established and therefore investors who want to capture or benefit from this return premium and diversification benefit need to be in the private markets in some form or fashion. Okay. Wow. All right. So that's super fascinating. Um, I, I've heard you mention at times too that, um, so correct me if this is wrong, but that uh, when you look at the public markets right now, um, talk about this a lot on this channel, um, you know, when you look at the indices, the major indices, right? The yeah. S&P, the NASDAQ, et cetera, um, the, the action has become so narrow uh, mm -hmm. that capital flows are increasingly flowing into um, just certain sectors of the economy and, re and really just into a select few companies in the economy. Um, and with all the passive investing ETFs and stuff out there, you know, for every dollar that comes into the market, a disproportionate share, I want to say it's like 37% or something like that, go into like the top 10 stocks. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas in private equity, um, you, you, there's just a, a much more broader playing field, I guess, is maybe right. the way to say it. Yeah, they, those are really important points. I, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, the private markets represent today a bigger swath of what I'll call the real economy, as opposed to a handful of tech names with technology that most of us don't really understand very well. Mm -hmm. So the bread and butter of the economy is being financed today much more by the private markets than the public markets. You don't see small IPOs anymore. You just don't. Not Adam, you and I are roughly the same age. When we came along, you saw 40 to $100 million IPOs. Right. Uh, Amazon went public at, I to think a tech name, I think less than $50 million. So there, there are a couple of things going on here. And I want to capture them all. I think they're important. First, a larger portion of the non-tech or non-headline sectors are financed by the private economy. Secondly, so much of the public markets today or the IPO markets are companies that aren't even profitable. You know, 20 years ago, 80% of companies that went public were profitable. 2019, 2021, through 2021, it, basically the reverse. So you've got wow. more speculative companies going public. Moreover, Hey, sorry to interrupt you on that, but is is it fair to say that the the public markets are more of a casino than the private markets are? You know, I probably wouldn't make that strong a statement. I'd say this: my faith in the efficiency of the public markets has declined over uh, over the last several years. Uh, I was trained in economics and and um, certainly trained on the uh, the maximum of efficient markets. But but think about it. So when I was in school, actually, my wife and I were talking about this, uh, taking a walk recently. She has her MBA and keeps me honest. The, <laughs> you know, think about the meme stock phenomenon, right? So our professors would have told us that a multi-billion dollar company trading on a national exchange, we're not talking the pink sheets, we're talking a, a tiny, we're talking about a substantial company. I'm not going to name a lot of names substantial company or companies trading on national exchanges, heavily covered by the press and equity analysts are trading at well above their intrinsic value, well above, not for days, not for weeks, but for months. So I, I, the professors that taught me or the mentors I had early in my career would have said that simply cannot happen. The markets are too efficient. For that to happen, but we've all we've all seen that. So I do think there are risks in the public markets today that were not present 10 or more years ago. And I really like the I like the fact that private markets have become more liquid, more transparent, more efficient. And so to some extent, the private markets and the public markets have switched places in that. The private markets are financing sort of the real economy, 
the, the bread and butter companies. Meanwhile, the public market seemed fascinated by a, a handful of, of very large cap technology, primarily technology oriented companies. So if you, I think the central point is if you want to invest in a broad swath of the economy, if you want to have a lot to choose from as a sophisticated individual investor, you need to figure out a way to invest in the private markets. And fortunately, the ease of doing that has opened up dramatically over call it the last three or four years. Okay. Yeah. And we're, we're ready to get to that in a minute. And look, I think I interrupted you when you were kind of on a roll there. So if there was more you want to walk through, please, please, please those, pick it up. Thank you. I think those are the key points, but I reserve the right to come back. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, again, I just want to under, underscore this because I, I want to make sure I and the audience heard you correctly. Um, in terms of sort of like um, w where the profits are, um, it sounds like you're saying that that more so these days, the profitable companies are are remaining private, and, and obviously we're painting with a really broad brush here. But you're well, you're, you're, you're let saying me address yes. it this way. So, take a company like SpaceX. Right, hard to imagine an enterprise that requires more capital investment than SpaceX. So, uh, twenty years ago, could a company like SpaceX, who needs to uh, attract billions of dollars of capital in order to build its enterprise? Could that company have stayed private through 25 rounds raising, I'm not sure the exact number, more than $10 billion? No, you had to go public. You know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, you had to go public in order to get the necessary capital to build an enterprise of size and scale. As we said, we talked about Amazon going public at less than $100 million valuation. Today, the private markets are deep enough to support the building of huge enterprises that require massive amounts of capital on a global scale and do so with the benefits of being private, not having to report quarterly profits to, a, uh, to an investor base that we've already discussed in a market that's perhaps not as efficient as one would hope it would be. And so the reasons to go public, well, one of the reasons, the fact you simply needed a sheer quantity of capital has basically gone away. And so the public, mar the private markets are just so much deeper today uh, than they were. And therefore companies stay private longer. We, um, we've done some research and, and some of the leading venture back companies, the real innovators, they're staying private seven years longer than they were not that many years ago. So that just gives you a sense of, of the fact companies, they, they may go public and they may need to go public at some point, but you just don't have to go public in a world where there are tens of billions of dollars of very sophisticated, well-organized, specialized private market funds with expertise in your industry that can support you as an entrepreneur and help you grow and scale while not being exposed to the vagaries of the public markets and taking on the cost and expense, Sarbanes-Oxley, public reporting, et cetera. So why would you go public? It's just not as important today. Yeah, and that, that, that's, that's just such a great point. So um, I think if you talk to any CEO, Given the choice, they'd much rather be a CEO of a private company than a public company, right? For not having to well, deal with I've been all a CEO that. of a public company twice. And uh there are, you know, I could I could talk a lot about that, but that's a different uh that's a different longer conversation. Those public companies were pools of capital that invested in private assets. So I sort of had the you know, the best of both or the worst of both worlds. <laughs> um, but I've I've experienced all those phenomena we just talked about. Okay, but but it, and correct me if I'm wrong here. If your experience is different, but but most CEOs would love to be freed from that pressure of yes. having well, to play. The question is, does it add value to customers? Does it add value to investors? And right. not, it's less and less clear that that's essential. It, it is in certain cases, um, like needing a currency to acquire other entities that's more liquid. But there's no question that the um, the requirements to be a public company. Or, or the um, compelling need to be a public company is just so much less in a world where they're deep, sophisticated private markets. Right. So let's let's take your SpaceX example here. Um, 
let's assume for a moment, I know there are doubters out there, but let's let's assume for a moment that SpaceX is successful with their goals, yeah. right? So eventually someday, you know, the the massive amounts of upfront investment uh, will be over, right? right? And they'll be more in a harvest phase, right? Where, okay, now we've got this fleet of rockets, we can, they're reusable, they're At cheap. At some can... point, the venture capitalist and management teams that um, took a lot of stock will ultimately want to achieve some liquidity. Right, and and maybe they take a public, who knows? What, what I'm saying with this is um, you can now have a, a truly gargantuan cash burner like a SpaceX fund itself privately, get to the point where it it gets into harvest mode and it's just making you know cash positive cash flows going through the roof at this point, right? So you've you've ridden uh, you're getting those tremendous returns that you hope to get when you came in as an early private right. investor, right? And and that could be a phenomenal return for you know the folks that invested early on in it. My point I just want to underscore is you're saying that opportunity, public markets aren't getting a chance to play in SpaceX, right? Increasingly, the really interesting high growth companies that can get away with going public, uh, private, and you're saying more and more can, likely will, at least until things change. And, uh, and therefore, more and more like really great opportunities are being taken off of the table or not even making it onto the table uh, for the private, the public investor going forward. And that's one of the key things I want folks to take away from this discussion here is like the really interesting part of the game is increasingly happening in the private room that the regular public's just not even getting a chance to look into. That is a fair statement. Okay. And, and All if right. you look further, just, I don't want to fill this thing up with statistics, right? But just the highest growth companies in the economy are private. They're not public. So if you're particularly focused on growth, it's just essential that you're in the private markets. Okay. All right. So I think we've kind of caught people's attention, right? We've given them a sense of you know what this space is and and, and why you know it's attractive. Um, there's going to be some percentage of viewers saying, all right, well, that Bob's just talking his book here, right? Um, so what are the risks of private equity? Yeah. Right. Everything has opportunities, everything has potential downsides. What are the potential downsides of private equity? Really important question. So first of all, you need to understand that the dispersion of returns in the private markets is wildly different than the public markets. So if you don't get into at least the top half of private fund investments, your experience may not be that positive. So I'll give you an example. So if you, we tend in our world to talk about quartiling, you know, dividing performance into fourths. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the top quartile large cap U.S. equities managers over a recent period of time, the top uh, top quartile, call it a 9% net return over a meaningful period of time. The bottom, that's the top 25%, 9%, that's the 9% uh, or better. The bottom, 25%, 7%. So yeah. look, the difference between 7 and 9 is meaningful, but it's 2%. If you look at the private markets, and let's take leverage, let's take leverage buyout market, for example. The top quartile, 22, 24%, the bottom quartile, less than 10%. So the, the importance of being in a good fund, being able to identify and access a good fund, I'm sure we can talk more about that, is just extremely important. Asset selection is wildly more important in the private markets than it is in the public markets. And so you need to be able to access those strong managers. Other risks and challenges. So first of all, you've got this structure we talked about earlier with capital calls and distributions. So when you commit to a private equity fund, you're committed, you're not actually invested. And by the way, often you're paying fees on capital that is committed before it's invested. So you've, and then you've got unpredictable capital calls. And then when they have a realization, they distribute it back to you. Then they may recall. So it's a back and forth. It's not like a stock bond or mutual fund where your capital is invested. So that back and forth is extremely important. Next, there's some further logistical and, and tax issues. These, these limited partnerships are partnerships for tax. So rather than providing you a 1099 in January, like you get from your brokerage account, 
they're getting a K1, which has many, many lines and many, many pages, and you're getting that in October. So you are, if you weren't otherwise, you are amending and extending your tax return. You know, you're filing a preliminary return on April 15 and waiting till October 15 to file your full return. So they're just layers and layers of complexity. Valuation. So valuation in private funds tends to be quarterly and it tends to come on, and it does come on a lag. So anywhere from 45 to 90 days after quarter end, you get a statement from the general partner indicating your value. So this is a fair amount of complexity and hurdles for the average individual investor, which explains why individual investors have not flocked to the uh, premium returns and, retur and uh, diversification benefits we talked about earlier. Okay, let, let me just dig into a couple of those. Um, so first off on the access side, um, I think that word access is really important. It is. Um, I mean, you, you, yes, everybody wants to invest in the top quartile deal if they can, yeah. right? Um, that's just common sense, but it's can you, right? And and I've heard in in the you know with, with retail investors who who historically get into private deals, you know, a real estate you know, deal, whatnot, right? You know, oftentimes the average person hears about it from a a friend or whatever. And, and the big question they have to ask themselves is, okay, why is this deal being offered to me, right? It's sort of like, yeah. there's an adverse selection, right? Where by the time the deal makes its way down to the inexperienced private investor, it's probably not a very good deal. If it was a good deal, the, the big guys would have snapped it up right away, right? So um, we'll, we'll maybe talk about this more specifically about some of the, the new things that are changing. But that sort of risk of like sloppy seconds or sloppy thirds yeah. or even sloppy fourths, like like that, that's a big concern. And you, you raised it. Um, valuation, I just want to ask a couple of questions on. Um, sure. Because, I mean, the valuation that matters, right, is is what the company eventually, you know, what the exit is and, and what, what you get paid for at the end. Along the way, the valuation number, is, is that... Is that basically just a number? You know, there's there's some process. There's a annual assessor or something like that that comes in. So it's it's not like the stock market hyper efficient in valuing what. Well, you get a price every day, in. whether and you know what you can sell it at, whether you think that's intrinsic value in the public market or not. You do know what you can sell it or where you can buy. It. Right, right. So so if I'm sitting here in one of these private deals and I get my quarterly valuation from the general partner, how's that being determined? These are really important questions. And the thing that I bear in mind most of all is valuations are ultimately confirmed by realizations. So I'll digress for a minute. We just finished our annual audit for the two funds that we run for individual investors. And one of the things I focus on is looking at where were the realizations in our portfolio versus the last valuation where we marked them. And I'm pleased to say that those valuations came in or realizations came in very, very close to the last valuation, which gives me comfort that the valuation process that we're undertaking is accurate. So let me expand that back into the broader ecosystem. Since the financial crisis, actually unrelated, um, it was uh, the accounting standards changed in 2007. And they went from a world that was basically lower of cost or market to a fair value every quarter system. I'm generalizing, but that was essentially what happened. And then since the financial crisis and coming out of it, valuation processes have gotten better and better. And so what you see today, and it wasn't always true 10 or 15 years ago, for the best general partners, the best fund sponsors, they're valuing their portfolio companies in a rigorous way and doing it every quarter, sometimes with the help of outside experts to validate, but they're doing it in a way that they believe and their investors believe is the best possible and most accurate value. So we today, those statements that we get are pretty darn accurate. It's obviously harder in venture because the companies are just newer and younger yeah. and what would be the comparables? Easier for the very largest leveraged buyout companies. But nonetheless, as an industry, I'm very proud of where we are in terms of valuation processes. And around that, what you've seen develop, and because valuations are solid, you now see a secondary market, and we can talk more about this later if, if you want to go down that path, 
the fact that there are solid and reliable valuations has led to a secondary market in private equity funds, which is much, much more robust and larger than it was prior to the financial crisis. But back to the valuations point, I think we as an industry have moved to a place where we are responsible and accurate, and that what you find is the actual realizations when companies are sold do validate valuations. Now, to your other point, this is a little technical. In the regular way, drawdown fund, what we've talked about so far, limited partnership, those valuations do not matter a lot to the limited partners along the way, unless they're choosing to try to sell in the secondary market, which most don't, because the management fees are based on the invested capital. They're not based on the market value. And the profit share that uh, the investors pay for a successful deal only comes at the end when, as I've said, the valuation is confirmed by a realization. So yes, while I believe those valuations are robust and pretty accurate, they are not as important to an investor in a, in a limited partnership fund. Now, the evergreen funds that we run, they're very important. Again, we can talk about, talk about that later, or we can go there now as it suits you. Okay. Um, uh, let, let's put it off just for a moment, because I do want to get to Kind of how the industry is is evolving to provide access uh, to the individual investor. But let me ask one last sort of negative potential question. Sure. And I and a you know, trigger warning, I might be spinning you up here. Um, so there is, uh, you know, there there is a a mentality or um, point of view uh, of of some that I've heard expressed of. Um, that, that's somewhat derogatory towards private equity of, hey, you know, these guys just come in and they just sort of, you know, rape these companies and they dump them on, you know, uh, the unsuspecting buyer at the end. And they're they're kind of hollowing out uh, business. Uh, I, I already know you're going to have a totally different opinion on this, but I literally like I just talked to, to Bethany McLean. I interviewed her uh, last week. Um, we did not talk about this, but she is finishing up a book uh, that will be coming out in the fall that has to do with with some of the the sins of uh, of, of private equity. And uh, I can't speak specifically to what they are, so it's sure. a little unfair to just drop that bomb and, and walk away from it. But I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the biggest, you know, criticisms of private equity. Um, how much there is there? Yeah. Well, we are not without sin, that's for sure. But I think and it's, not like most, the, it's not like the public markets are out with that sin either. But but yeah, but, sorry, go ahead. Look, most of what I read um, is criticism that is frankly pretty shallow. Uh, first of all, if you look at all the statistics around private equity, institutional caliber private equity, what you find is it is a net job creator. The gains and returns are driven to a large extent by increasing revenue increasing profits, and not just increasing profits, which of course can involve cost cutting, which is probably one of the concerns that your guest uh, your guest is, is focused on. But revenue growth in private companies is dramatically high. So that's coming from increasing sales. That's not coming from, from cutting cost. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a complete misunderstanding on how private equity firms, but these are the general partners, make their money. Yes, they earn a management fee along the way, but the bulk of their profits come from selling companies profitably. When unfortunate incidents happen, like a, a bankruptcy of a company owned by private equity that may have had a substantial amount of debt and that may have contributed to the, uh, to the downfall of that company. Well, those losses were suffered by the private equity investors. And those are typically done in a fund. And the way these funds work, if that loss has to be made up by other gains before the general partner or fund sponsor participates in the profits. So picking out individual companies and indicting an industry, I think, is, is not analytically rigorous. But the, the key messages are net job creator, net revenue grower, and the profits and returns speak for themselves over thousands, if not tens of thousands of data points over good markets and bad now for 30 or more years of the modern private equity industry. Okay, good. Th thanks for going there. I just 
in case some people in the back of their mind had, had heard, you know, some of those those criticisms and that was keeping them from fully engaging in the conversation, sure. I wanted to give you a chance to address that head on. Um, okay. Now, in the remaining time that we have, um, you know, let's get to the really exciting part of this, right? Which is that, right. um, as I said in the intro, uh, not only has private equity oftentimes been a world that's that's kind of been invisible to the average investor, they didn't even know it existed. Um, but even if they did, it was in many cases extremely hard, if not impossible, for many to actually get access to it. Um, sounds like things are changing now to make this more accessible to folks. So if you can kind of tell us what some of the, the the biggest new opportunities are that are out there that that my viewers here, you know, would be most interested in learning about. And in your answer, if you cannot touch on that access issue, right, right which is okay, great that they're getting access to private equity. But we want to make sure that they're not just getting access to the the sloppy fourths, you know, that are out there. Right. Well, let's let's recap then. So the challenges for individuals getting to private equity have been opacity, right? Understanding the returns. They've been access, actually being able to invest in the best managers. They've been higher fees. Many of the products offered to individual investors have had higher fees, and then you've got. The, uh, the lack of liquidity, which most investors struggle with. You know, these funds are, they're generally set up to be 10 years with two one-year extensions. But if you actually look at what happens from first cash flow to last cash flow, it tends to be about 15 years. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a marriage, right? That's yeah. a not, not everybody marriage. has that horizon. Absolutely. Not yeah. everybody has that, has that horizon. And then, of course, you've got the tax issues, which I mentioned. And then you've got high minimums, the products offered to individuals. Have typically had minimums. The low end of the minimums generally been two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So if you happen to be the client of a private bank and and they offer you a feeder fund into one general partner's private equity fund, typically a two hundred fifty thousand dollar minimum, and, and often more than that. And then finally, I don't think we've covered this at all. The investors in those funds have to be qualified purchasers, as defined by the SEC. Five million or more of investable assets. So just a lot of barriers. Okay. And, and sorry, just because you mentioned it, is a qualified purchaser different from an accredited investor? Is it yes. an even higher standard? Yes, it's five times as high. Okay. So an accredited investor has a million dollars of investable assets. And I'm obviously I'm broad brushing over some nuances here, but in general, qualified purchaser, five million, accredited investor, one million. Okay. All right. So those are all the things that were kind of keeping people out. Yeah. Right. So what's happening now to be able to bring those walls down a little bit? Well, we're very excited about the growth of evergreen funds in the private markets that invest in institutional caliber assets. The challenges that have been faced are overcome to a large extent by the evergreen fund. Let me describe what that is. Okay. The evergreen funds are basically look like mutual funds. Now, to be clear, this is not the liquid alts strategy that people heard about, hedge fund strategies packaged in a mutual fund. That's another thing entirely. But these funds are regulated like a mutual fund. For those who know, regulated under the Investment Company Act of 1940. They're also typically registered under the Securities Act of 1933, like a public company. So they file similar reports. They're subject to that level of oversight and governance. So the Evergreen Fund is offered in this mutual fund type format. And what's particularly interesting about it, when you invest in one, you're fully invested. You're not committed with capital called in return, capital called in return. Those who run these, and we do, the sponsor of an evergreen fund takes on the obligation to manage your cash flow for you. So you're invested. You're not just committed to a fund. Moreover, these funds offer liquidity typically on a quarterly basis at 100% of net asset value. Now that liquidity will not be for 100% of the fund. It will be for typically 5% of the fund, not 5% of your investment, 5% of the fund. So most investors can get out of their investment on in a quarter or two under most market conditions. Okay, and sorry, just to be clear on that, does that mean that this evergreen fund Rather than saying, okay, you're in, you're locked up for 5, 10, 15 years, yes. it's quarterly, there will be... There's an off-ramp. An, an off-ramp, yeah. And, and if at any, you know, it's it's not daily, it's not on demand like the stock market, but 
it's, hey, every quarter, we're going to give you a chance if you want to, to get out. Yes. And, and, and really, the way I think about it is the Evergreen Fund allows you to deliver most of the illiquidity premium of the private markets in a structure with quarterly liquidity. Okay. So, and, and unlike your private assets, well, then your public assets, you can sell them every day. You may not like the price. Your private assets, almost impossible to sell if you're an individual investor. The Evergreen Fund, it is a hybrid. You can sell every quarter and you will like the price because it'll be 100% of net asset value. So that's the, that's the liquidity profile. Importantly, and this might not be obvious to your audience, when if you invest in an Evergreen Fund and they typically accept investments daily, weekly, or monthly, let's use monthly, it's the easiest example. So if you were to invest, decide you wanted to invest in one of our Evergreen Funds this month, well, we'll hold the closing at the end of the month. You come in and buy a pro rata piece of the investments that I'm in. I was in the first close. I've been invested in, in those funds for a couple of years. We have 5,000 other investors invested in our core fund called SPROM. You would come in just like a mutual fund. You know, if you put in a mutual fund order before four o'clock today on Monday, you know, you'd have gone into that, that pool at a mm -hmm. price that struck overnight. This is the same thing. You are buying a mature, diverse portfolio on the run, if you will. And it's designed to give you that access so that you're immediately invested into a pool. So mature, diverse, with relatively easy or regular access, and then quarterly liquidity. The Evergreen funds are organized like a mutual fund. So they provide you a 1099, not a K-1. There are none of, none of these calls and distributions. Yeah. So it's not nearly as onerous from a tax perspective. It's not onerous in, in that respect. You get a 1099 in January, again, like you would from a mutual fund. And then the minimums range, but the minimums are generally about $50,000 for certain share classes for most investors. And they're available. Some, some are many are available at the accredited investor level, the million dollar net worth. Some mm -hmm. are available below that. We don't offer those funds, but a million dollar net worth versus the $5 million net worth of a qualified purchaser. Got it. All right, great. So that's super, that's super interesting. So those are evergreen funds. Um, I've also heard you talk about tender and interval funds. Yeah. So a tender fund is the manner in which the evergreen fund provides liquidity. So think about evergreen funds as the, as the universe. And then within that, you can have tender funds, interval funds, non-traded BDCs, non-traded REITs. We've sort of focused on private equity, so we'll stay over there. But those would be the four categories within the evergreen fund world. So a, an interval fund has firmer liquidity. The liquidity is basically mandatory every quarter. A tender fund gives the board, an independent director group who manage the board, again, like a mutual fund, they have more discretion around the liquidity. And that's the difference between, between the two. And therefore, the investment strategies followed by tender funds tend to be more flexible. And you see more private equity-oriented uh, strategies in the tender fund and more credit-oriented strategies or yield-oriented strategies in the interval fund world in general. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, now that we're kind of beginning to get into details, um, it's super clear that this world of private equity is a big world, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, Bob, I wanted you to come on to the program here to kind of provide people with, you know, kind of a newbies, you know, sure. uh, expect or, you know, explanation of, hey, what private equity is. You've been doing a great job, by the way. Um, but obviously, I can tell that in a lot of cases you're you're having to really give me the for dummies version when there's a lot of depth uh, beneath the yeah. actual explanation. So um, I'd love to have you you know come back on the program again um, as as much as the audience wants and as much as you're able to, Bob, to help people you know really develop a full picture of this space, where the opportunities lies, how to play in it, et cetera. Folks, if you'd be interested in that, Please let me know in the in the comment section below, and if there's uh, you know continued interest, we'll we'll keep bringing Bob back on. Um, so Bob, it, again, probably an unfairly com complex or, or simple question to ask you that that has a complex answer is: 
okay, so we have these new evergreen funds, like from an investor standpoint, how do you evaluate them? How, how do you determine right. whether one's good or not? You know, Adam, I feel like I need to go back and pick up a step that we uh, we didn't get to, if I could. Okay. So, yeah, go for it. With a typical private equity fund, you experience the dreaded J-curve effect. And the J-curve is you commit capital, you don't get any back, and you actually have a negative return in the early years because you have fund expenses without fund gains. Sure. Let's so use SpaceX. Have... All they're doing is... is... Yeah. Burning and, rocket think about fuel a fund, and think about a fund in which you've got some organizational expenses and management fees to go out and buy great companies that don't get marked up for a few years because they don't deserve to be marked up for a few yep. years. And you don't have realizations. Okay. You've, so you've got a J curve in cash flow and a J curve in returns. One of the benefits of the Evergreen Fund, or the goal, is to start and stay on the upswing of the J curve. So if you come into a high quality evergreen fund, you're buying mature assets that are closer to their realization phase. So you're benefiting from those gains as the companies are sold. And then that capital is constantly being reinvested. So again, uh -huh. analogous to a mutual fund, very different from the typical limited life, limited partnership fund where you buy some companies, experience a J curve effect. If it's a good fund, you know, you, you, you benefit from that. You get paid back for it. But a lot of individual investors don't, aren't really set up or not comfortable with this J-curve effect. And a good evergreen fund avoids the J-curve effect, or as I've said, starts and stays on the upswing of the J-curve. All right. That's super fascinating. I totally get the benefit of that for the uh, investor that doesn't have the iron stomach and, and necessarily the years to sit through the, the, the trough of the J. Um, so how are how are, how is the Evergreen Fund yeah. managing this? Are, are they are they only buying companies that have kind of crossed the chasm? Um, and if that's the answer, um, obviously that's where the really big gains are in private equity. Is if you're early, you ride right. the negative part, and, and then you get the moonshot later on. So do Evergreen funds? Um, how do their returns compare to the public markets? You know, I'm I'm presuming that that the the comparison you mentioned earlier on included the whole J. So how how much yeah. does it narrow? I need to think about that. So I'm not going to speak to the returns of our specific fund. They are available okay. on our website, and uh, we're very proud of them. They have uh, dramatically outperformed the public markets during during our life. But of course, past is not prologue. And, Prior results are not necessarily an indication of future results. And if you're thinking about our funds, you should look at the prospectus. That all said, what, what the high quality evergreen funds do is they give you a, a return profile that's more analogous to owning a stock or a mutual fund. You know, one of the criticisms your, uh, your guest whose name you mentioned earlier that I didn't capture, she, one of her valid criticisms might be Internal rate of return, which is generally the way private market funds, you know, is, is a pretty different return from a multiple of invested capital. You know, if I buy a mutual fund today, I put in a hundred thousand dollars, three years I sell it for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I know what my point to point return is, as opposed to a private equity fund with an IRR, which involves capital coming back. You know, an IRR is a discounting of cash flows back based on a mm -hmm. return. Uh, again, probably a topic for a longer conversation. But the evergreen funds really give you a true point-to-point -point return. So you can compare them to a mutual fund or a stock bet. But back to your question, how do you evaluate them? Here's how we think about it. We designed our business around three pillars. First of all, convenience. Is it easy to invest in? Is the information easily accessible? Second, efficiency, which is a nicer way of saying inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Are you being charged fees that are a significant premium to what retail, sorry, are the retail investors being charged a premium to what an institutional investor would have to pay to access the same investment strategies? And then lastly, transparency. We are very focused on making sure there are never any surprises for our investors and the high quality funds and competitors that we have are also no surprises. What they charge and what the expenses are for service providers, you know, the third party expenses, all those are very clear and clearly disclosed, no surprises. So focus on 
convenience, efficiency, and transparency. Beyond that, you mentioned sloppy third, sloppy fourths. This is a key issue, and, and frankly, a lot of the reason that our team uh, built this business at Stepstone. You want to be invested in an evergreen fund that is getting equal access, peri passu, to use a financial term, equal access to the same deals that the firm's institutional clients are getting. So Stepstone serves about 150 of the world's largest and most sophisticated institutions, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, and very large foundations, and damaged pension plans. Our two evergreen funds, really it's four, including our offshore funds. Think of it as, think of it as two strategies. Our strategies are simply another client of Stepstone. So when Stepstone is able to access a really attractive co-investment or really attractive secondary purchase of assets at a nice discount, our funds are getting our pro rata piece based on our annual deployment budget alongside those other large sophisticated institutions. So if we're able to buy a package of funds from a sovereign wealth fund, a deal that we did, at a 22% discount to net asset value and a very large pension plan that's a Stepstone client, it was in that deal, we're getting the same deal at the same discount at the same terms. So asking that question is really, really important. Are you getting the same institutional caliber deals? So convenience, efficiency, sorry, convenient, efficient, transparent, and then deal allocation. That's really critical. All right. Wow. That is that is super useful. All right. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a ton of questions uh, coming out of this video, Bob, about, um, all right, so, you know, what are the ways to play this, right? Sure. What are the options that are out there on the table? You, you've mentioned, and, and to your credit, really just as examples in your answers, you know, some of what Stepstone does. Um, I didn't give you the real chance to open the kimono and, and tell the whole Stepstone story. Um, maybe we'll do that in a future video to help sure. people kind of understand how at least one big player yeah. is doing it. But presumably there are many other ways to play in this space too. Again, if the, the demand is high enough, we'll have you come back on to, to you know talk all about it. Um, maybe even what we can do at some point too, Bob, is we can, if you're up for it, is we could do, uh, we have the ability to do these um, discussions live where Mark, we can open it up that. to the you know, the audience to actually ask questions live and you can just field whatever they care about most. Um, so uh, sadly, just looking at the time here, I'm going to have to begin to yeah. wrap this up. Um, the question I've sort of been thinking as you've been going through all this is be because the private equity world is now, you know, so much larger uh, than the, the public equity world and, and so many of the opportunities that used to go public are now going private. I'm just curious, as you look across the scope of your career, here, um, would love to hear, you know, an example of of the best the, the, the best return you've ever had on an investment. I mean, you're, you're, you, you, it seems like there's an ability there to hit some real grand, grand slams. I'm curious, any particular one stand out for you? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you an off the run answer. Uh, my best personal investment uh, is what I would call an infinite IRR. I've been fortunate to be involved with gift of adoption, and many of your viewers probably don't know that it costs. Twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars to adopt a child in the United States, and even more if you're trying to do that offshore. And there are thousands and thousands of families who have most of the money, but don't have that last five thousand or so, that last mile, uh, that last piece to complete an adoption. And so, at Gift of Adoption, we do grants of about five thousand dollars, and with a five thousand dollar grant, we effectively create a family, which we think of as an infinite IRR. Oh my God. All right. Yeah. Who can compete with a return like that? That that's, that's amazing. All right. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, so many questions still, um, but you, you've done a great job of kind of laying out the basics for us here. Um, thank you. And like I said, uh, we'll have you back on the program and, and really start continuing to appeal back this onion here. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of knew some of this coming into this discussion, but just the magnitude of, of how much of the activity and, and honestly, how much of the growth and, and profitable activity is happening outside of the public markets. Um, it really is, I mean, in some ways, kind of irritating to learn about that <laughs> in terms of what we as just regular investors I've got, have been I've got that in. reaction. And again, if you're, I don't know how what your feedback system is, but another, I give a talk to Chartered Financial, 
chartered financial analyst societies across the country. And one of the talks we give is on increasing liquidity in the secondary market and how that works and, and how you can access. So if you're if your uh, viewers are interested in learning about secondary market liquidity, either I or one of my colleagues would love to talk about that. I think it's particularly interesting. Okay, great. Folks, you want to hear about that? Let us know below. Um, all right, Bob. Well, look, um, for folks that have really enjoyed this discussion and would like to learn more about you and your work and perhaps StepStone, where should they go? StepStone PW, StepStone Private Wealth. You can Google that or our website is stepstonepw.com. Okay, pretty straightforward. All right. Well, look, um, folks, if you've enjoyed this discussion with Bob um, and would like to see him come back on to continue to peel this onion, um, again, let us know in the comments section below. But please do us a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, Bob, this has been great. Really appreciate you giving us so much time for this discussion. Really look forward to having you back on the program again soon. Thank you so much. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.